Welcome. The following podcast was recorded live at the 10th National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis, Indiana. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, uh, Max Studios. Welcome, everybody. So I think this is our first live talk show. Uh, we're missing Ryan Shield. He's sick this week. He sends his regards. I'm happy to have Jordan from Everything Catholic, uh, one of our most illustrious guests on the show. He's been on the show many times. And John, the Catholic gentleman, it's good to see you guys. Uh, we're at the National Eucharistic Congress in Indiana. Um, we're at our first day. Uh, it's good to see all you people here live uh, uh, with us. And so, yeah, so we're just going to jump in. Um, you know, the Eucharist is, uh, is the source and summit of our faith. So uh, I know you guys have been hearing a lot about it, starting with Mass this morning from Cardinal Dolan. But, uh, yeah, so we're just, we're just going to dive into to our Eucharistic testimonies and maybe, um, you know, get into how we live our lives uh, through the Eucharist uh, in our in our daily lives and our vocations as fathers um, and working in, in the church. So, yeah, John, welcome. Yeah. Well, this is my fourth time being on the Catholic Talk Show. So, <laughs> um, I'm an expert now. Uh, but, yeah, no, I'm really blessed to be here. It's such a joy. Um, I just am so grateful to see all the movement and the Holy Spirit. I, I did pull up a scripture here because it was what I was feeling yesterday when I was here, and that's from Romans 12, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I feel like we all have this opportunity here in a very unique way to be transformed, right? I mean, 60,000 people are in one location. I mean, if that doesn't provide hope, if that doesn't provide excitement, if that doesn't provide power and grace for the Holy Eucharist uh, to just set forth. And for me personally, I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, I came here with my own problems, came here with my own opinions, and, and I just want to, I want to remove that, and I want to be transformed and renewed in my mind uh, by Christ in the Eucharist. So Amen. that's what I'm hoping for here. Amen. Amen. Jordan. Yeah, no, happy to be here. Um, Sport the new mustache, man. I like it. That's right. Very much. Uh, I like it. Trying it on, you know, might return like it later. It, I really do. I kind of get caught staring at you every <laughs> morning. <there. laughs> Making me blush. <laughs> uh, no, you know what? It was cool. I was talking to my wife this morning, and we were just like, you know, why would so many people come to something like this? And, and I was telling her that there's just, from what I'm observing, there's just this energy, there's this joy of being surrounded by tens of thousands of people who believe the same thing you do, and all in one place. Um, it's not like, you know, spotting a unicorn out there that's like, oh, there's a Catholic, you know, I don't see Catholics very often. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, you know what, in some ways, maybe this is kind of like a foretaste of heaven because we're going to be surrounded by people like that up in heaven and how wonderful that is. So it's, yeah. I love walking down the halls and seeing like little flocks of sisters running around. Yeah. I think it's the most amazing thing. <laughs> they all move in flocks. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the friars are packs, but the <laughs> sisters are flocks, right? It is a, it is a Catholic conference, you know, uh, you know, the parking lots and people trying to get out. There's a few pushers out there, you know, moving people around <laughs> while you're walking. No, I, um, I, I, I want to start just uh, with what Cardinal Dolan said. It really hit me hard um, about how we hunger for the Eucharist. And, like, I have this sort of this operative way of receiving the Eucharist. It's still beautiful and still awesome, but I, I didn't really associate – the fact that I was hungering for God when I went to mass and, and, you know, I needed it, I need him. And so, you know, I look at my conversion, there's a lot of CFRs here, Franciscan mm, yeah. Friars Renewal. Um, and I, I was in my worst, uh, and I got invited, um, to go on this retreat. Um, and I was hoping to meet some good girls, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And they brought Jesus out in the monstrance and, uh, I was like, what are they doing? What is this? I mean, I don't even know what's going on. Um, and so you had to sign up to go sit with Jesus. And so I signed up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, there was a pretty girl on there next to it. And so I signed up. And then I went in there. And I'd encountered uh, Christ in the Eucharist, I believe, for the first time 
And I, I remember saying to myself, like, man, I've been, I've been looking for this, like, my whole life, this sense of peace, this sense of unity in my heart. I felt like I was, like, like throwing myself out into the world, expecting it to give me some sort of peace and some sort of, I don't know, togetherness in my soul. And, like, that was the moment that, that changed my life. And uh, I remember walking around everybody like, maybe I'm crazy. I'm like, do y'all, do you guys feel like the presence of God here? You know, <laughs> like, yeah. and everybody's like, yes, we do. We're Catholic. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. But um, yeah, and then, you know, moved next door to a perpetual adoration chapel and was mm-hmm. in there every day for, I mean, probably a year and a half before I went to the seminary. And, but, but it was a hunger that yeah. Cardinal Dolan mentioned today that I just, it really resonated with me. It was like, I was hungry and I was eating terrible food, mm. you know? Mm. And how blessed are we, you know, to be able to share at that table with each other, you know, as a family, yeah. family of God. Amen. That spiritual food that we all need. I think when I reflect on my own story, I was um, hungry as well. I was uh Going, doing my master's degree at Yale, and while I was there, mass was offered by the Dominicans, uh, Father Gregory Pine and, and that group, um, three times a day. And confession was offered before and after every mass. And then Yale had mass done once a day as well. So there was four mass opportunities for me to go to. And I was, this is the first time I left home and so there was like this anxiety, you know, within me about not knowing anybody and not living anywhere. And so I found my home with Christ in the Eucharist. And I, I remember going to the Dominican friary there and just sitting down with the tabernacle the first three weeks that I was at Yale. And it just transformed my heart that uh, that visit. I didn't know what it was. I actually was doing it more out of obligation. It was kind of like, I found peace in that, so I was going to go to that, hmm. and and it was it was there that God was working through me, and I actually started discerning the priesthood because of it. Right? It was it was so moving and so transformative just to place myself daily presence of of Christ anywhere from fifteen minutes upwards to like two hours. I remember just sitting there at that beautiful church and uh, right there with the tabernacle and just trying to talk to him and just trying to better understand him. And, uh, and he unveiled himself to me in a way that I, I never expected. And so um, I'm not a priest now, but um, I did discern that as a result. So that hunger, that our spiritual food that we so desperately need is available to us, um, both in um, physical Holy Communion as well as those spiritual communions in the time that we spend with him. I, um, I had a really, I think, profound experience with the Eucharist in, in adoration. Um, Adoration was something growing up that I was a little nervous about, like, spend a whole hour with Jesus, and, you know, what am I supposed to do during that time? And Such a boy. I know. <laughs> I was like, I got to fill it up. Like, let's figure this out. Um, and, and so it wasn't something that um, came easily to me, but it, one summer when I was in college, uh, I got to go spend the summer up in New York City with the Missionaries of Charity, and we ran a, a kids' camp, and... Um, all of the guys that were in the group with me stayed at a homeless men's shelter that was run by the sisters. Mm. And we were all on like the fourth floor and all the men were on the second floor and stuff like that. It was, it was, it was great. And we had a seminarian who was staying with us. And because of that, he could expose the Blessed Sacrament and every day we would have adoration um, in the evening after we finished camp. And, and it was not the quiet, peaceful adoration that I have experienced since then. It was the loud, noisy New York City uh, adoration experience. We, they didn't have air conditioning, so the windows were open, so you're hearing car alarms and music from cars as they're driving down the street, people yelling at each other outside. This was right in the middle of the Bronx, uh, so kind of a rougher part of New York. And, um, but it was during those eight weeks that I was there going to adoration every day um, that the Lord really worked on my heart and helped me understand what it was all about. It wasn't about an agenda. It wasn't about coming with things to do to fill up the time. It was about just sitting there and mm. being in his presence. And, and it went from something that I struggled with to something that I couldn't go through the day without. And it was a very profound experience. And it's something that as I've signed up for adoration um, at my parish now, um, as an adult, I'm brought back to, like, I don't need to show up necessarily with all these things to do. I can just kind of sit in God's presence and let him work on me um, mm-hmm. and just give him that 
time. And that's been, that was a very freeing thing for me. But yeah, it's very powerful. Great. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I think now we can kind of just, well, I, first I'd just like to say this this hunger that everybody has here is is beautiful. Um, just receiving communion in the Lucas Oil Fieldhouse this morning was very special, it was very beautiful, just to see everybody from all over the place, uh, you know, there at the table, there to commit time in their lives to come here to celebrate um, God's love for us in the Eucharist. Uh, it's been a really beautiful experience so far. Yeah. I think, you know, you mentioned it's like heaven, and I, I remember thinking that, and I'm like, well, maybe he doesn't have a field house in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he's got something nicer up there, I don't yeah. know. But uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's really beautiful to see, see so many young people, um, priests, mm -hmm. bishops, um, just all supporting this amazing, beautiful part of our faith, the real presence of Christ. Yeah, you know what's coming to mind is the fact that we're all family here together, right? We're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and in a transcendental way, more so than <clears throat> our blood bonds. And we get to actually experience that together. I feel like it's actually something that we lose very frequently in the church, right? This idea we're going we're going to be missionaries we're going to go out and we're going to bring people into the church that we tend to lose sight of the magnitude of our family here and the fact that we are brothers and sisters together as one in communion and we get to experience that in holy communion together is just so moving and honestly i mean you never know what to expect at these things but you can like physically feel the grace as it's moving through in these locations from people from every corner guam right every corner of of the world um out of our you know the united states here uh, coming together to to share in that communion and i i guess i just encourage myself encourage all of you guys to remember the family bond that we have here how we are all in this together and we are all struggling with this together and the sufferings that we endure we endure together as body uh, the body of christ as members of christ and and that's just one thing that i am going to take with me and just uh joy uh to have been able to celebrate all that with you guys yeah that's one thing about <clears throat> the show and just seeing uh listeners here and they're praying for my wife mm. like these are these are these are prayers you know that they're praying and it, it's you know Somebody told me, like, we're, we're all monstrances when we receive Christ in the Eucharist. We take it into the world. Um, we take him into the world uh, in that very particular sacramental way. Um, and it's great just experiencing the response of prayer from, from folks that listen to the talk show, from my parish back home, just the support that we've been given, uh, allowing people to love my family, my wife this way, why don't you share a little bit about what Jen's going through for those who might not know? Yeah, so about a year ago, she wrecked the van, and then we were in Montana, and uh, and then we went um, home, and it was July 4th, and she was just, she had headaches for like a week, and she went to get a CAT scan, and she has glioblastoma, which is uh, not, not, I don't, it's not curable. Um, some people have had remission in it, but not many. And um, so they removed a, a tumor out of her uh, head that was the size of a golf ball. It was in a really good spot where, you know, her speech wasn't affected. Various functions of her brain that could have potentially been harmed were not harmed. Um, so they took out about 96% of that. And um, there was just a little bit left uh, there that they didn't want to take out in case they harm parts of her brain. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so from that, obviously, like chemo, radiation, and then, um, you know, that worked in a sense where the tumors didn't grow, but you can't really radiate a brain um, constantly. Uh, that's just not a, it's not a good, good thing for a person. <clears throat> chemo, too. Um, so we uh, qualified for Optune uh, recently. We just had an MRI, and there's another tumor in the frontal lobe and one by her spine. So it's pretty. Uh, it's been pretty rough. Yeah. Um, well, we all love you guys, and so I encourage everybody here to please offer up prayers for Jen and for Ryan and their family because it has been something that I've shed tears over, and um, and so I appreciate you sharing that with us. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, shift into the Eucharist, right? So I did, I think it's important to talk about 
uh, how we learn about the Eucharist. Like, why, what's the importance? We need to know God, we need to love God, we need to serve God, right? And so um, how do we know him in the Eucharist? And by listening to podcasts and coming to events is one of them. The one thing I wanted to share with you, because this is an opportunity that uh, took me down deep into the love of the Eucharist, is this book right here called Jesus, Our Eucharistic Love. So if you don't get anything else out of my speaking today, uh, get this book. <laughs> and, and this book is so phenomenal. It goes through just uh, like a hundred saints and a dozen things that they stated on the Eucharist. And I found myself while reading through this and going through this, wanting to spend time with Christ in the Eucharist. And, and let's be honest, right? It's not always immediate to mind. I have six kids, 12 to eight months. And so, you know, I might want to get away to the Eucharist just to get away from chaos. But, um, but this book is infectious and it brings us deeper in. And I think that um, when I think about the Eucharist and how I've personally grown, this was given to me in confession and it was slid underneath the little um, screen. Mm. And, uh, and, <laughs> And uh, so that was, for me, again, how I grew to know and to understand the Eucharist in a way that brought me to want to spend time with him and to want me to fall in love with him. Because, again, that's how I learn, and maybe you guys as well, as um, the, Thomas Aquinas talks about it, but it's, you know, from knowledge then, you know, moves the heart and transforms the soul and the body. And so for me, this is... This is one of the primary tools in my life that uh, that transformed me. Yeah, that's great. Is that the one you read in college? Yeah, it is. I got well, it's just out of college, just out of college when I got this one, and uh, um, I did pass it on to uh, Sister Josephine Garrett like over a decade ago, and she fell in love with it as well. It's a, it's a pretty phenomenal book. Do you guys ever like? I don't know, like a day, like not Sunday mass, but you just don't go to mass you know, during the week or don't go see Jesus in the tabernacle and you're like, I don't want to do this. And then you're like, I'm just going to do it. And then you mm -hmm. go and you're like, why did I say I didn't want to mm -hmm. do it? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> it reminds me of Paul when he's just like, I do what I, you know, yep. I don't know what he said, but it's something like that. Yeah. That's <laughs> about right. Yeah. <laughs> the daily mass is a good one. And I know not everybody has the opportunity to go because yeah. of maybe the timing and things like that or the, the parish <clears throat> that you're near doesn't offer it when you can go, but man, just showing up day after day or a few times a week outside of Sunday Mass can do a ton. I mean, it's, I, I think that it's just being there in his presence. Work on you. Yeah, it's miraculous. We've got the, uh, the miracles exhibit here. Um, one of the, <clears throat> there was like a DVD or something back when DVDs were a thing, and it was uh, a scientist that had uh, taken samples of, Eucharistic miracles that mm, were bleeding, yeah. and then he sent them to a doctor. Like, it was very arbitrary. It was not sort of in line with, hey, we're going to call a Catholic doctor and tell him what it is. And they said it was heart tissue. It had been traumatized. It was like, wow, this is like the beating heart of God mm. that we're receiving. Oh, and he <laughs> wants us, though. I mean, he wants us. He wants us yeah. to experience that transformation and to be in, you know, yeah. to be in love with him because he's in love with us. And, I mean... I also called now to talk a little bit about being able to share with our kids. So we yeah. all have a lot of kids. Jordan, how many kids you got? I've got four boys. Seven. Right. Yep, and I've got six. I've got six with me, seven already entrusted the infinite love and mercy of God. And, um, and what an honor and what a privilege um, to be able to pass that along to our children. And Jordan, I'd love to hear from you what you do to enrich that within your kids lives yeah yeah i mean it's it's a lot of small little things you know i mean i think the the example and the witness that joanna my wife and i um provide to them by going to mass together there's a lot of households where only one of the spouses goes to mass and there's studies that have been done on what that does for kids mm -hmm. and their um, likelihood to continue to be catholic as they grow up and mature so doing that together is is a big one. Um, sometimes we'll we'll split up and go to mass at different times with you know a couple of the boys here, a couple of the boys there, and it's fun to be able to do that and just have more of an opportunity to have that intimate time with them and really talk to them about what's going on. We'll bring little things to keep. So my boys are young. Um, I've got a 
12 year old, but then I've got little guys. So I've got a, a seven, six and a four year old and finding things to keep them busy during mass is important. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll bring little things that help them understand the different parts of the mass. Um, what's going on, why this is happening, why that's happening. They like to look around and see statues and talk about those. And um, I think also, you know, trying to have them go up and, and meet and talk to the priests and normalize that for them, you know, like the, the, this is somebody that's going to be a part of their life and that they you know, should be used to seeing priests and things like that. I think those are important things to do, um, you know. So lots of little things like that are, are just kind of where we are right now. Yeah, they build up. And um, Ryan, what about you, your family? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's Im important for, like like you said, uh, that both the husband and the wife uh, share a love <clears throat> or an understanding of the Eucharist and the importance of it and the centrality of it, not just to our faith, but also in the home. Um, you know, I was just thinking about, I was like laughing because I'm thinking about you and your four boys and <laughs> like you do it in bits and pieces. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, uh, you know, obviously uh, educating them and, and, and showing, educating them through, through your life and showing them that this is, a, this is a part of your life. This is the most important part of our life. Um, and then, you know, as my children get older, uh, you know, it's sending them to, to camps and places where they can be by themselves with peers and you know all the things that are important to their uh, development of their faith with around their peers is a very important thing. And then um, I've got Ava with me today. I yeah. don't know if she made it out of the room. She was taking a nap, but uh -huh. um, but uh, you know just sharing this with her and and going to mass today and her just asking all these questions like why is he wearing that hat? Why is you yeah. Know, and just being able to answer them and and uh but but yet still with with the understanding that we're all continually learning our faith Amen. it's never never ends it's a you road know, that never ends there's something that you mentioned um about not only in in teaching our kids these things or guiding the, our kids things but it, it was just resonating how our kids can teach us right because they have this innocence about mm -hmm. them and in that innocence um that acceptance of of Christ physically present, um, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. They have uh, they have this yes, this fiat that um, that has changed me. And uh, something you mentioned about sometimes you don't want to do it, and then you go forward and do it. There is a um, particular adoration that happens once a month, and it's like the praise and worship adoration. And um, it's not my cup of tea, you know, but uh, it is my children's. And so my wife will make sure that I take them. And to your comment, I'm always glad that I did. And the last time that I took them, my uh, nine-year-old daughter, Gianna, Gianna Rose, she uh, wanted to go to the prayer team. There's a charismatic prayer team in the corner. And she went over that. And we don't know what she did. We don't know what she said. But when she got done, she went straight to the front of uh, the altar and knelt down. I mean, praise and worship's going on. Christ physically present there in the monstrance. She went, and the prayer team, these adults, you know, 50, 60-year-old uh, adults came over to us and said, have your daughter pray for us, please. <laughs> like, there's something going on in that little girl's heart. And I was like, thanks be to God, we took her here, and we didn't get my way, which was going to be to, you know, sit at home and <laughs> who knows what, but not go there. And so, um, and it was just that reminder of like, you know, she is is God's daughter as well, you know, and, and yeah, sure, I've, I have this uh, opportunity, I have this um, obligation and responsibility, but when we say yes to that uh, in our kids' lives, seeing their transformation has transformed me. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that. No, and seeing Ava here, when I brought Gemma to another daughter of mine, when I brought her to seek, and uh, there was uh, Eucharistic adoration. I'm sorry, there was um, uh, uh, the pilgrimage. There was walking, you know, yeah. um, and seeing everybody get on their knees when Christ was passing and getting my, see my 12-year-old do that yeah. and everything was just like, man, I didn't have these experiences growing up. Yeah. You know, so I had to come at it from, 
from the head. But um, God's hunger for your children is being exactly. manifested in your life as a father. It's so true, and yeah. and I couldn't be more grateful for that. Yeah, yeah there's, um, I don't know, like, Sometimes I try to get them ready for mass. You know, I've got seven kids, so three of them are somewhat uh, talkative. And then uh, the other four, I'm trying to prepare for mass. You know, like, hey, you know, prepare for mass. Where are your shoes? They're laughing. Yeah, Yeah. they're like laughing. Forgot the shoes. Uh Took his diaper off. Um, But, um, uh, yeah, one of the the things that I, I... try to share uh, with them is to uh, ask God to give you the grace to see the poverty that you have in your soul, like mm. where where you can invite him, where you feel like you don't have him, like just somewhere where you like lock off uh, a, a window or a door um, in your soul to him and invite him there because you'll be so surprised that he'll mm. he'll just go right in there with you. Yeah. Um, you know, that and then also the strength that it gives us, the strength that the Eucharist gives us to avoid sin. Like, I mean, not completely, but uh, like I've experienced times where I'm, you know, I'm doing something and I'm like, man, when I'm spiritually tired, I would not have done that. Mm. <laughs> you know, like That's I just right. wouldn't have done that. And so I also tell them like, this is this is something that will give you a supernatural grace to do things that Christ does in you and you'll be able to see that and witness that in your life to understand more deeply how connected you are to him it's so true we're broken men and without him we can do nothing and in our pride we maybe don't appreciate that or understand that but then when we have these moments you're exactly right i would say that the eucharist has done that for me and again i know go back to this book here when i reread it multiple times but every time I go and um, receive the Eucharist now, I've realized how grateful I am and how, um, how not everybody in the world has this. I've got a close CFR friend who do, um, goes and does mission work in China, and he just explained how you know there's 120 villages and they maybe get to receive Christ once a year, maybe. And, um, and so again, that transforming effect of, of the Eucharist and our brokenness is something that I am so grateful for and something I always need to go back to. And by God's grace, I'm able to experience on a regular basis. You know, I think one of the things that I have not done personally, but I've heard other people share about that would be a really cool experience is because of the, the universality of the church, going to other cultures to experience how they mm. experience the Eucharist. Like I, um, our good friend, Any Hickman, I remember him telling a story one time about going to Africa, and, and there was this big mass, and everybody's just like this amazing celebration, and and people are, are just going bananas over the fact that there's yeah. the Eucharist, like going nuts, right? And, and you know, you, you would not see that if you came into a church here in the U.S. You know, in the way that they do it, and, and it's a different oh, yeah. culture, but there's something infectious about that where it's just like, that's Jesus. Yeah, I got to serve at a mass very similar to this one in at the American Airlines Arena in Miami, where I was in the seminary. And for every section, it was for Our Lady of Caridad. It was the the Cuban title Mm -hmm. uh, there. And uh, so we're giving uh, communion out, and I noticed that they there's no lines. Everybody just kind of presses in to Jesus. Mm. It's actually really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and how it's like you know, the crowds just, pressing yeah, in on them. That's it. Yeah. 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 I was just like, you know, this is this is awesome. Like this is how they this is how they hunger. Mm-hmm. You know? Um and even going to like Our Lady of Guadalupe and we went on a pilgrimage to Portugal, Spain, just seeing the different um the different hungers like like uh, uh Cardinal Dolan was talking about how they approach this magnificent gift that God's given us right. to um, to just fill our hearts, you know? Yeah. I'm thinking about how when COVID hit, how we didn't get to mm-hmm. experience Christ in the Eucharist and how that was, um, <clears throat> it was very difficult for me. It was something that I, um, in fact, I'm still renewing my mind 
um, uh, to uh, because of that. But one of the fruits of it, I would say, is um, practicing spiritual communion. And I don't know if you guys know that Saint Alphonse's prayer, but I encourage you guys. First time I ever heard about it again in this book. Um, and uh, did you write that book? I know. Or I, I mean, like this I, is... I just read it that many times. Um, he may or may you not can buy get it out of everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, is and you guys probably saw that, right? You you got to watch mass on on TV, and then during when we would normally receive Christ, there was uh, everybody. Like I was, I watched mass in Sydney. I watched mass in Poland. I yeah. watched. Mass all over the place, and they'd always have that spiritual communion uh, by by Saint Alphonsus, and it's something that I started to practice on a regular basis, like um, multiple, multiple times a day, and that has enriched my uh, reception of the actual um, communion, you know. And I know that Christ came to Saint Therese, and He said to her that both of them bring Him great joy, and and that's been a transformative um, experience in my life as well, something that has allowed me to live it deeper. And in practicing that, in living that, you know, when I get to go and receive Christ uh, physically, it's all the more enjoyable. So, and all the more transformative, you know. So, I encourage, you know, yeah. anybody to. So, I say that there's a fruit of, of the COVID. Um, you know, it's funny about COVID. Um, so, my oldest son, Judah, he's 12 now, he received his first communion during the midst of the pandemic. So, there was no precious blood, it was just the body of Christ, right? And so, um, and then many of our churches in town did not bring it back afterwards. Mm. Um, but one of our parishes that we, well, there's two churches in our town. We went to one of them uh, last Sunday, and and they had the precious blood, and he, he did not know what to do. He's like, what is this? And I'm like, <laughs> well, let's talk about it. Uh, it was just funny because I'm like, this was something so uh, so used to, you know, for my whole life, and then it was very new to him because of, of what had happened. Yeah, that's a that's a beauty. I didn't know Saint Alphonsus Liguori wrote that. Yeah, they usually don't cite that in the. Document. They don't. It's just there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, no, it's really it's really beautiful. Saint Alphonsus, uh, amazing. In fact, um, uh, visits to the Most Blessed Sacrament, another book that he wrote, uh, worth it's free online. You guys can just Google that and you'll find it. Visits to the Most Blessed Sacrament, also a great meditation on on deepening your life and your prayer life uh, for Christ in the Eucharist. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the name of the book my wife uses. It's like it, it was this whole, one. <laughs> no, I'm just. <joking. laughs> <laughs> oh god, it's like a it's a holy hour, something like powerful holy hour, or something like that. She's bought like hundreds of them and given them out, but she swears by that. Father Donald Calloway just wrote a book heads recently, on it or something. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, Father Donald Calloway just wrote a book recently, um, uh, 30 Meditations by St. Okay. Peter Julian Amard on the Eucharist and just some of his great writings. And so I just picked that up, and I'm looking forward to, to diving into that. Yeah. Another thing, our Blessed Mother. And, uh, and so I grabbed a couple more quotes because I think <laughs> these are really good. I'm a quote guy. If you ever watch my podcast, that's what it is. It's like quotes. And, um, you know, why make up things myself when I can sound smarter by quoting the saints? Um, so St. Gemma Gogani, how beautiful it is to receive communion with the mother of paradise. Uh, we've also got St. Peter Julian Amard said, the best preparation for Holy Communion is that which we make with Mary. And uh, ever since I got uh, true devotion to Mary, uh, St. Louis de Montfort in the back of his book, his treatise, he has uh, the preparations for receiving Christ through Our Lady, and you go through each, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and he's got the prayers laid out, and you just uh, talk about Our Lady entering in, and then God entering in through his most perfect daughter, and then Christ entering in through his most perfect wife, and the Holy Ghost entering into you through his most perfect spouse, and through his immaculate uh, spouse. And in receiving Christ in that way has brought me into a deeper love uh, for Christ in the Eucharist. So, yeah, so that's a good book. I'm doing the consecration right now. The the um, 33 day Louis de Montfort. Yeah, yeah, um, total consecration to Our Lady. Yeah, yeah. What else you got in that quote book over there? <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of quotes. <laughs> you do have a lot of quotes. It's yeah. Like, like well, actually, here, here's another job. quote. Yeah. Um, uh, so we got Peter Craved here. Um, if you guys know Peter Craved, praise be to God, he's a living legend. But he just was talking about living, right? And that's what I'm getting at, right? We've got to live this. And that's what we're, you know, the revival starts with you. The revival can't stay here. All of these beautiful things that we need to really take to heart, take to prayer, so that we can better understand that. Peter Craved said something that I really enjoyed and I grabbed 
we want it all. We want God and, but we can't have God and because there is no such thing. The only God there is is God only, not God and. God is a jealous God. He himself says that many times in his word. He will not share our heart's love with other gods, with idols. He is our husband, and his love will not tolerate infidelity. A hard saying, especially in our age, which is spiritually as well as physically promiscuous. And so there is some compelling God words. Only. Yeah, God only is what we are here for. That's what we are here to be transformed for. That's one of the promises of the Eucharist, right, is that we will become God-like as we are giving ourselves to him, as we are trading our very lives for his life, and as he has humbled himself and he comes to us in the blessed Eucharist, we get to receive and say, yes, take over my whole soul, take over my whole life, Be, use me as your instrument of grace to the rest of this world, um, so desperately need myself included. There's also like, <clears throat> like this is, I remember when I was single living next to the Adoration Chapel, and I had a lot of healing, uh, a year and a half's worth of healing that God called me to mm -hmm. sitting in front of him. Beautiful year and a half. Um, and then after the seminary, I got married, and then we started having kids. And when I was married, I, had a, um, I was a youth minister. And so I was around church all the time. I got to pray all the time. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and then we started having more kids. And then I remember like my prayer life was like, it couldn't be the same. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to a priest and I'm like, I just, I'm not praying like I should, this and that. And he was very wise. He told me that, you know, that you're gonna have a circumstances in your life that, that force you to pivot your spiritual practices, right? And that helped me out a lot because I was kind of confused, like I thought, you know, this was my prayer life and I can't have this anymore and I don't know what to do. And he's like, well, you just have to ask God where he's trying to place mm -hmm. um, you in the circumstances of your life to uh, engage with him. And that was the time I started reading more. Mm -hmm. You know, when the kids went to bed, mm -hmm. I, I, I read a lot more books, started doing novenas and devotions with my wife, you know, um, things that I never did before. And it opened up a whole nother world. That's why it's like God's just so vast in yeah. what he can do in your life that even pivoting from the circumstances in your, in your life, he still floods your soul with his grace, you know? And, and, it, and it continually changes. I'm sure I'm not in the only, uh, you know, circumstances that I'm in now. It's just like even with my wife, our prayer life has changed. Mm. Like I've allowed her more personal time with God and so that was like the best advice I ever got from a standpoint of like looking at um, like just looking at wh how I'm praying and wh where my engagement is with God and what could be improved or where I'm being called um, that, that was really good advice and I think a, a lot of you probably have experienced something like that too I was pretty young when it happened so yeah you know no thank you for sharing what are some things what do you guys think are some things that folks here can do when they go home to kind of help keep this, this fire for the Eucharist alive um, or to continue this revival? Because, I mean, we've all been to many conferences in our lives, and you come home with this kind of conference high, and you're in this bubble, and it's amazing, and then you come home, and there's not all the same things always at your fingertips. So what are, if you had to pick one right. thing that you would encourage folks to do when they go home, what would that be? Oh, I have a quote over here. I'm just joking. <laughs> um, I thought you were going to say the book. <laughs> yeah. I got this book right here. Book. Uh, it's really good. It's got a lot of quotes. In yeah. It. <laughs> it's, it's got words. It's got a lot of words. <laughs> so um, I, would, I would encourage you to uh, pray the spiritual communion, uh, to grab it and to pray it like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I do like what you were saying. We do have this high, and very often we leave and we want to do 10 things. Mm -hmm. And then within a couple of weeks, we don't do anything. And so it was so important. And you, whether you knew it or not, the Holy Spirit was working through you because I immediately thought of three things. Ooh, and then I was like, no. But I was like, no, let's keep it, let's keep it simple, right? Yeah. Let's keep it to where we can actually achieve this. We have to 
create habits and virtues incrementally in our lives. And so for me, that would be my encouragement because it doesn't require you to go to a church. If you live by a church, great. You know, that's even better, right? You can go sit there um, in, you know, 10 minutes a day, say hi to Jesus, right? Um, but if uh, this one can be done, you know, just prioritize three times a day, you know, mm -hmm. um, talk to him, know that, you know, remind yourself, remind him that he is physically present. You don't have to remind him, but you remind yourself uh, that he's physically present in the Eucharist and, um, and then ask him to never leave you. And so I'd encourage that just three times a day and stick with it and see what God does mm -hmm. with you when you give him that. What'd you do, Ryan? What'd you do? I would say, <laughs> thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think, I think if, if you know, the fact that you're here, um, mm -hmm. you know, or even listening to this later on when, it, when it's out there and the internets, but um, you're a fan of the Eucharist here, you know, you are into your faith, right? So maybe find an area that you struggle in that you mm -hmm. want to build up and get better at, or, um, you know, maybe it's, you're already going to adoration uh, or you're already doing daily mass. So just doing more of that, sure, that's great, but maybe find an area that is uh, that you struggle in that's a little harder and put a little bit of work into that. And that could be different things. for different. Yeah, I, I do. I agree with you. Like everybody's here. Um, if you, you know what the Eucharist is, you know that's Christ and you're here because of that passion that this is sort of a, an experience that I think God wants us to have. He wants us to be around each other to celebrate his love for us, specifically in the Eucharist, like that is a gift that he paid a dear price for, um, was tortured for. And so for us to show our appreciation to experience that hunger and bring it to him, it's definitely like a mountaintop experience or an experience where, you know, in our daily lives, we're not around the things that draw us away from God. Mm -hmm. um, when I usually get back from something like this, it's... Um, I take more time to do an examination of conscience. So, and, and not be like critical of myself, but like in midday, I'll say, okay, I woke up, I ate some baked beans and drank some coffee. But I'm not British. <laughs> I'm not just joking. I, didn't, I don't eat that for balance breakfast. Balanced breakfast. I had, I had baked beans in, in London one time. I was like, what are y'all doing? Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but like at noon, so like, you know, I ate breakfast, you know, like just going through your day and paying attention to the movements of your heart. Like this guy came into work. I can't stand. Okay. Well, that's something you got to like now take to God the next time you go to mass or in prayer right there and just improving like the little things in your day to spot certain things in your life that you feel like there's a pattern of to change. Uh, Father Mac Hill, who's been on our show, mm. um, helping while Father Rich is out, uh, I was at a daily mass and he's like, you know, I see everybody here at daily mass and it's so beautiful. He says, but I want you guys to all know that if you leave here and you hate your son-in-law, still, after going to mass every day, you're not bringing your whole self here mm. and you're, you're you're going to Jesus of the Eucharist, but you're not bringing him everything that he's deserved and earned mm. to, to come into your life. And I was just like, and do I hate anybody? I'm like going through, like, I don't like him, but I don't hate him. Maybe I should let Jesus in there, you know, but like just uh, for, for me, it, it was uh, my spiritual director told me like, it, it, take time to examine your conscience when you come back, because that's when all the sharpest, mm the sharpest pangs come in your life. Because mm. you're in this place, you're like eating ice cream and it hanging beans. out with everybody, and then you go home it and it's beans. like, there's the real life again, you know? Um, that's a personal thing, and then like the parish thing is just obviously the movement of, in your parish and with your priests and everything. Maybe to get more active in how you can um, share the Eucharist mm. with other people in the parish in particular ways, yeah. you know? That's I'd love to see people do more, be more in, in outward about their sense of community, right? Mm, like me too. one of the things that's so cool about being in a place like this is like everybody here is Catholic and they're happy to, you know, they're proud of it. They're not trying to hide it. Um, but then you go back home and you could be 
you know, in the grocery store and not know that the person next to you is also Catholic because it feels like it needs to be hidden in some way and, mm. and be really, be really exciting to be in a place where that could be more outwardly visible. Yeah, I would agree. And you're reminding me of something that I'd like to uh, mention going back to being family, right? Is that it was a uh, guest on my show, Jason Craig, who said when a gentleman at your parish comes to you and says, my son just left the faith. What's your first thought? And he said, is it to mourn with him and to talk to him about praying together? He said, or is it calculating and saying, what did you do wrong? Like, mm. you know, what, what was his life like and stuff like that? And it was really convicting because Christ comes to us in communion. We are called to be in communion. We are one body of believers and a family. And when we don't act like that, outside of events like this, the world senses it, right? And we're meant to be that opposition to the world. We're meant to not be conformed to the ways of the world, but to renew our mind. And so hmm. I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. I'd love to see that family bond grow in our parishes and extend beyond, because then you're bringing people into your family. Hmm. You know, you're not just bringing them into the Catholic faith, you're bringing them into right. your family. Yeah. And, and that has such a lasting effect and such a transformative effect. Bringing them to the Eucharist. You're really good at this, Ryan. I'm going to talk to Ryan or talk up Ryan here. The amount yeah. of times I've seen Ryan walk up to a homeless guy and give him a hug or walk up to somebody and invite them to adoration. It's I've never I don't know anybody else that that I in my life that yeah. does this just readily. Like there's this sense within Ryan here of love that that he pours forth and that he comes out with, and it's it's shocking to me. It's you've shocked me many a time, um, you know. Or a lady gets up at mass, right, because she doesn't like something that the priest states, and then Ryan jumps up and goes after her, not to argue with her, but to share love with her and to try and bring her back. There's this real um, beauty and sense of of uh, community that that. So thank you for that, Ryan. It's been a testament to me many times uh, in our yeah, relationship. I'd, I'd like to thank Spanky of Indianapolis because he was a homeless guy <laughs> that gave me his jacket. I was cold, and the guy gave me his jacket. Wow. Can you believe yeah. that? Well, I mean, you, you went up to him. So, yeah. yeah. We There's, took him to dinner after that. Yeah. He was a really cool guy. I tried to get him in here. I think it was like Seek or something like that. Yeah. I tried to sneak him in. It was pretty funny. <laughs> he does. He's a good dude. Right? <laughs> I was like, you got to do this, man. It's adoration. He's like, what's well, adoration? You know, I'm like telling him about it. And, That's right. Yeah. And there's no expectation. <laughs> just show up, you know? That's it. You just show up. Right. There's a, gosh, probably, there, there is a, a priest now in uh, Kentucky. And my pastor in D.C. was like, you need to go by this guy's house. He's going down to the evangelical barn down there. His parents aren't Catholic. And this is a very densely populated area, so I was literally like 15 steps away from my house, four houses down. And, uh, you know, I had to report back to my priest, and so I knocked on the door. I was like, Jack, Russ, and he comes out, and I was like, hey, man, um, I hear you play the guitar. I got the youth group at church. I want you to come. Long story short, he comes. I have this long conversation with him about the church that he's going to. He, he was the most mature spiritually. He had a gift, uh, in my opinion, spiritually. And I went home, and I told my wife, I said, I think I just met a future priest. Wow. All I have to do is show him the Eucharist. Mm. That's, what I told, mm. that's what I told her. I was like, all I got to do. So we went to the Mount, and like I guess he had this experience, and we were up talking like all night. He called me. <clears throat> years when I was in Houston, so probably five or six years ago, and he's like, are you going to Seek? I'm like, oh, my gosh, how you doing? I'm with this Franciscan friar group. I'm in the seminary, and I'm like, wow. So we came here, or was it here or St. Louis? I can't remember, and we had a, a long conversation, but uh, I guess that's another thing is don't underestimate what Jesus can do with yes. a guy in a room. Amen. For an hour, it's shouldn't be underestimated. That's right. Die to ourselves. You're literally showing him it. the proof. And I've taken know. people there before, and mm -hmm. they've not responded at all. Yeah. And I've also, it's just kind of like that passage of dropping seed on yeah. the ground, and then it choking it out, and the thorns and everything. But like that, that doesn't really. lessen your drive to continue doing that. No. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. No. It's just, it's right there. So. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, you we have some... Yeah, we got some goodies. We got some gifts. We, got we some have goodies. gifts. Yeah, I guess. 
Thank we you. We come bearing gifts. All right, so about these? yeah, I've got a couple mugs here, a couple Catholic gentlemen Catholic mugs gentlemen that I'd like to. Uh, oh, a couple books, a couple Catholic gentlemen books too. Um, and so we need to do like a trivia. So who can tell me who the um, apostle of the Eucharist is? Dude. No? No? Oh, I think I heard it. So I'm, we're going to give it to whoever said St. Peter. It's St. Peter Julian Amard. He's called the apostle of the oh. Eucharist. I didn't know that. There you go. So, yeah, I, I can't see because of that bright light. We'll put it right here for when the lights come on. Yeah. Was there, a, was there a child screaming? Who is the mother or father of that child? We'd like for them to get one of these, too. That's right. Making sacrifices. Amen. Actually, is, are they still here? Oh, um, they left. Oh. oh, they were outside. I take that back. Okay, take yeah. Back. <laughs> Um, Completely take it back. Jordan, your turn. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I've got a couple goodies here uh, from everythingcatholic.com. We've got our chrism scented beeswax candle. Delicious. And then we've got uh, chrism scented organic lotion and room or body spray. Um, so if your room or you smell not so great. Not like chrism. <laughs> these are awesome. They are awesome. Um, I agree. So we'd like to give this bundle away to somebody. Um, and my question is, who here has seen three different flocks of religious sisters and can name what those religious orders are? Got to be a flock. Two or more, or one or more. Or, no, two or more. Two, or two or more, more gathered, yeah, it's yeah, a flock. It's a flock. Well, that works for I me. Can't, I can't even repeat that. I think that, that was two. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. All right, well, you come up and claim this when we're done. That's great. Yeah, let's do the same thing, but for um, priestly orders or friars or something like that. Does anybody, has they, oh, we got one right here. Perfect. Nice. All right. Awesome. And what amazing apparition of our Blessed Mother occurred in the early 1900s? Yep, Fatima, whoever said that first. Over here. All right. Nice. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so very much for joining us today. It's, it's just a pleasure. And we're so grateful for you being here. You will be in all of our prayers. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, Ryan's doing better. Had a little health scare last week, but he's doing better. And he um, has been talking to us and uh, wishes you all the best yeah. here this week. Agreed. Uh, Jen's doing all right. The medical stuff is not good, but she's doing well. Um, she's got amazing, very strong faith. She does. She's just drawing people into God's love somehow doing that. It's just amazing. Um, but medically, it's not good. So we're just going to continue to pray for her, and we've got her going into more trials and stuff like that. So it's been, a, been quite a journey. Yeah. Well. I know you are. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Max Studios. Hey, this has been fun, guys. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. you're on five times, and you're like six now? Sure. Mic drop. <laughs> sure. Well, drop the mic. God bless you guys. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Right, Thanks everyone. for coming out. This podcast was recorded live at the 10th National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis and was produced by Mac Studios at the University of St. Thomas, Houston.